I would like to open the floor now for questions and comments. Uh, I, would, I will ask you to be very brief, <laughs> as we are running a bit late. So you have the floor, sir. So uh, my question is for uh, John Mark. Um, so thank you for your presentation, very interesting. Um, as far as I'm aware, the ac recent academic literature shows that there is a strong correlation between democracy and economic growth. So although there might be some outliers, it tends to, the findings tend to be that democracies tend to grow more when you look holistically at all the potential cases in the world over a large time span. So there are a couple of reasons why this might be the case. Firstly, because you're defending individual freedoms, and secondly, more substantively, you're defending property rights. So there's one thought, have you got any kind of reflections on the counter-argument that actually democracies are very important? And one, another reason why you might think that the China, the China <coughs> example is often raised in this case, but I often wonder what would the counterfactual be in this case? So what would, how would China have developed if it had been a democracy? Now, my sense is that it probably would have still had a very rapid rise in terms of socioeconomic rights. Um, and would have done better in civil political rights. One thing you said at the end was that we should only really, if I, if I understood you rightly, we should only really be concerned with socioeconomic rights. No, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's right. I think that there are civil and political rights are very important as well. So there should be two judges. So it's civil and political rights and socioeconomic ones. And that's how we should judge political systems rather than simply socioeconomic ones. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, there was a gentleman uh, uh, over there. Thank you. you have the floor, sir? You're not, no, not you. Thank you. You? Um, <laughs> I suspect that Mr. Otorabayev's comments will, will provoke the, mo the richest discussion through our, uh, throughout this section. Um, I'll say that for my own part, um, I'll, I'm, I'm an unabashed pro-democracy person, but I would, I would offer a couple of views. The first is that um, you gave some examples of democracies that have failed to deliver the goods, for example, or countries that call themselves democracies that have failed to deliver the goods for their people, such as Iraq. I would put it to you that that's not an argument against democracies, that's an argument against bad democracies. And the outcome of bad or fraudulent democracies is just as bad as the outcomes from, from uh, authoritarian regimes. The second thing I, I would offer is the view that um, there are other social goods, or there are other goods beyond um, material goods. And I would say freedom from oppression is a, is a clear one. Um, I, it strikes me as, I'm always amused when I hear dictators call themselves strong men. Um, in fact, they are weak men, because only a weak man needs to govern his people at the, through the barrel of a gun. Ultimately, I would say that, in, and I hesitate to say this to you as former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, but I think that the chaos of democracy is almost always, of a genuine democracy, is almost always better than the brutality of, di of a dictatorship. And I would say that Kyrgyzstan is an excellent example though it has a strong parliament, as, as I understand it, a strong parliament, and therefore difficulty in coming to consensus, I would rather live in Kyrgyzstan than live in Uzbekistan or Tajikistan, and because those countries are, are, really are authoritarian regimes that have at least all of the problems of Kyrgyzstan and none of the, the virtues of, of Kyrgyzstan. And finally, I, I guess I, I would say that um, while I, I agree with you that the Arab Spring revolutions have not generally turned out the way their populations would like. Your comment about Eurocentricism is, a, is an important one. It, was seven, it took 700 years from the signing of the Magna Carta to the establishment of universal manhood suffrage in the United Kingdom. It's only been a few years since the Arab Spring happened, and I think it, it would be to hold emerging democracies to an unrealistic standard to expect them to come up to the full strength of established democracies, when those established democracies themselves took many centuries to get where, where they are. And finally, I, I think the best, the best proof is in the long-term course of these countries. That is to say, there are very few countries that have become functional, established democracies that have slid back willingly into authoritarianism, though there are innumerable states, authoritarian states, where people struggle and willingly die in the hopes of becoming democracies. Um, for yourself, um, I, I can't claim to be a, an expert on Kyrgyzstan, so I emphasize that again, but your story reminds me a bit like the Epic of Manas. You came down out of the mountains, perhaps with 40 companions, um, to, to, to lead your country. I don't underestimate the difficulty of leading a country like, like Kyrgyzstan, especially 
in the aftermath of the Tulip Revolution, but I would take the chaos of Kyrgyzstan over the authoritarianism of self-styled strongmen any day of the week. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I ask the speakers to be uh, a bit brief in their interventions because we are running very late. Xavier, you have the floor. Thank you, madam. Um, when uh, the, some uh, state and uh, observer said that the Arab Spring uh, failed and uh, many people uh, added that uh, those countries were not ready for uh, democracy. And uh, uh, I am a bit surprised, for instance, uh, how the international community is silent when, for instance, in uh, Congo and uh, in some uh, African country, we change the constitution for uh, the head of state to stay longer. Europe. Europe is totally silent. Just imagine tomorrow, Barack Obama decide to, to change the constitution of the US. Not only American, but uh, uh, all the world will react saying this is impossible. But in Africa, we, we don't care. Why? And why should not we universally propose a limit if we cannot stop them from moving the constitution a limit for the age of the head of state. Why all countries adopt a limit for uh, working every day? Because we have to be pensioned at a certain age, but for uh, uh, driving a country which is more heavy, we have no limit. I just received a message saying that Teodoro Biang Ngema uh, in Equatorial Guinea have been reelected now. He is uh, 34 and he have been uh, in power 37 years. And uh, Dos Santos in Angola, 74, 37 years. Mugabe, 93, 36 years in power. Paul Biya, Cameroon, 43 years, 30, 34 years in power. Museveni from Uganda, 72, and 30 years in power. Omar al-Bashir, the same. Idris Deby, the same. And uh, with, I will finish with a joke. Elizabeth II, like 90 <laughs> and 65. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your Very intervention. Nice. There's a gentleman, I, I, even though I have my glasses on, I can't, can't yes. see your name. Okay. You have the floor, sir. Okay. You were first? Yes, we were first. Oh, you're so many. You have to keep your interventions very brief. Uh, I will start being very brief. I think you had the chance to, to, to chair a, a panel where you had two completely opposite approaches here. The first, if I understood correctly, Yakumopoulos, and please clarify to us, your point is that we cannot have a sustainable economic growth in a situation of lawlessness and a structural democratic deficit. So I think that you argue that uh, given the situation in Ukraine, for example, things are difficult, even more difficult for economic development. Whereas in a situation where you have a normal, let's say, rule of law and democratic institutions functioning, things can get better. And this is completely the opposite uh, of, uh, of your argument. Uh, uh, according to which, and correct me if I'm wrong, I deduct that what is important is to, to develop a middle class by all means, including non-democratic means. And then we might reach democracy. Here, I have an objection. I mean, I have many objections, but I will just raise one. I think you were not right by saying that Tunisia is the Arab country with the most important middle class. The, the Arab country with the most consolidated and compact middle class has been Syria, uh, an extremely authoritarian regime, which actually the existence of which contradicts 
the basis of your argument. So I'd like a comment on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brevity, please. Uh, now I, I'm turning to this side of the table, which I have been completely ignoring. I apologize for that. Uh, who was the first of the Troika asking for the floor? Briefly, because many questions has already been uh, been <clears throat> raised, uh, I would like to point out the fact that economic growth doesn't mean development and doesn't mean that it can favor or help the establishment of consolidated uh, uh, and recognized uh, human rights. There are, of course, economic and social rights, but there's a lot of... Uh, important uh, civil rights that uh, uh, must be considered if we want to create uh, a, a true democracy. Um, I personally believe that the example that you gave us are not those uh, that uh, I should suggest to take uh, as uh, an opportunity, a possibility of uh, matching economic growth and, uh, and uh, mm, well, reduction of uh, poverty because they are not accompanied uh, by the fulfillment and the enjoyment of fundamental human rights. I should prefer to quote, just in case, the experience of Brazil uh, that has been able to really raise in a democratic environment uh, uh, the living condition of millions of people. And again, uh, on the issue of, the, of uh, Tunisia and the Arab Revolution, I, uh, uh, I agree with Dimitros. In Tunisia, I think that the difference is that this is an articulated democracy, as they should be, where also civil society organizations are recognized and have a role uh, within the constitution and within you know, the, the dynamic of the democracy. And uh, I, I'm not an expert of uh, Arab countries, uh, but my regional secretary of the, of the main regional secretary, he says, well, you had your middle age in Europe uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, the uh, 19th century, uh, uh, the first millennium, and it took uh, about 700 years for you uh, to, to reach uh, uh, the principle or to start thinking to the principle of democracy. Let's consider that the Arab countries are, are starting their middle age. Thank you. Uh, gentleman over there. Brevity, please. Brevity. Okay, I will try to be brave, but uh, I think the, uh, what uh, Prime Minister Otobayev was talking about democracy, uh, and uh, I think it is the trappings of democracy that are not working. You know, I have been, uh, I have heard these things many times in Central Asia, also in Afghanistan, that democracy is not a way, but a kind of a, a benevolent <coughs> dictatorship probably will uh, bring the country out of the uh, problems. The problem is that I was covering Central Asia from 2000, uh, 1993 to 2000 and saw the, the transition from uh, the uh, authoritarian uh, system of the Soviet Union to democracy. But at that time, I think it was only trapping a democracy. The same people who were uh, in charge Overnight, they became nationalists and democrats. And uh, the uh, privatization uh, of, of, of economy at that time, overnight, you know, changed hands from the government to the same people who worked in the government overnight. Uh, I think it was uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan in 1993 that uh, one person who was uh, in the opposition, you know him, Tupchubek uh, Turgan Alif, uh, the head of uh, 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 Democratic Party. He told me that the problem here is that democracy uh, here is the same as run by the same people who were autocrats in the, pa in the past. And privatization is, he called it, zapatizatia. It is a grabbing of, of, of the, this is the problem. 
In Afghanistan, uh, I was the only person I wanted to first build the institutions and then hold elections for democracy. Because only election cannot bring you democracy. And uh, because if you do that, those people who are with money and gun and power, they will run and they will win and they will legitimize themselves. And I called it that warlord democracy. Yes, democracy, yes, you can hold elections, but the people who win are, do not believe in democracy. So therefore, I think, unless you build the institutions, it is very difficult to only believe that trapping of democracy can help you. However, it's a long way, it's a painful way, but you have to start from somewhere. Eventually, that will lead you to some kind of a, a democratic uh, system. But if you wait and say, okay, it's not working, let, let's go to that benevolent dictatorship, I think at some point, everything will collapse. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, who, was, who was the first to ask for the floor? The lady. You have the floor, madam. Tuli. Tuli. Thank you. Um, again, uh, we had another insightful and thought-provoking session. Um, I know everyone is interested in democracy. I was quite fascinated by the ICJ. For me, it was a quick lesson on how the International Court of Justice operates. And it said something about something similar to our institution in some ways, the ombudsman institution across the globe, that often it's not just the kind of remedies you offer, the binding nature of the remedies you offer that is important, but just the whole notion of loss of face, the, the ability to change minds through moral suasion of some sort. I noted that, yes, there's been some cases where there hasn't been compliance, and, but it would appear to me that the, that's a minority of cases. So in terms of just transforming ideas through moral suasion, it would appear to me that the court is doing something. My only regret is that there isn't much being said about the ICJ except law school. And I think perhaps uh, we need in society to know more about it. And which brings me to an earlier conversation we had that I mustn't be understood as we go back home to be saying we should replace the UN with something else. It is the best we have. And even on the South African case, the point I was raising was that civil society ran faster than the UN and, became, and then civil society became a catalyst for change in the UN. But ultimately, the governance and, and the uh, uh, the moral voice and the political power in the UN was a huge determinant on the way forward. So as we move forward in our societies, you don't want to replace the UN, you don't want to replace the EU or the African Union, but I'm asking for more civil society voices and um, Judge um, Julia, if more civil society would know about these institutions, the ICJ, the ICC, we, there would be more <clears throat> using that information to transform how governments see these institutions. And we could also hold our governments accountable when they try to get rid of these institutions as some of our governments are doing. Just one last issue on, on the question of benevolent dictators. Uh, all I can say is that I like the thinking out of the box and I like the notion of us needing to rethink democracy. I, I think we do need to reimagine democracy. Um, it's supposed to be the government of the people by the people, but often the only place where the people have a say is in the ballot box. Beyond that, it's not consultative. So if I were to take anything from what you'd say, I would say in Africa, democracy to work, it should resonate with the way people were governed historically. There were no benevolent dictators. Perhaps maybe in one or two societies there were, but most of it was consultative. So it's not just the few governing for us, it's the few governing with us. And the problems that we have at the moment is that once we've elected the few, 
they actually complain when people start questioning how they're governing. They say everyone wants to govern, and whereas governance is supposed to, me, to mean that throughout the process of governing, the people get involved. So I, I don't particularly subscribe to the idea of a benevolent dictator. At the AU conference, the prime minister, I think of Ethiopia, advanced that. I really disagreed. It's the same thing as people saying men can rule for us and they will make sure that women get some of it. It's impossible. It's impossible to think for everyone because you're living out a whole lot of experiences that have to inform how we move forward. You need the disabled people to have a say. You need the people, the transgender people. You need everyone to have a say on how we move forward. Otherwise, the solutions we come with are not going to be responsive to the needs of everyone. But to also say that you want to free some of the communities uh, for a couple of years whilst we reach a particular progress, I have a problem with that because then you say once they've advanced, they're going to spread a few crumbs. From where I'm sitting, say it doesn't work, but I do think that making us think out of the box and reimagining democracy is a great idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to turn to uh, this side of the table again uh, and uh, invite Thordis to take the floor. Thank you, Iggy uh, I have a very quick question, I mean one minute, to Honorable Judge Julia. Uh, because it relates to the discussion throughout the whole day with respect to the Security Council, whether it's not acting or acting too much, and a wonderful question raised this morning, who should guard the guardians? <laughs> and you took us a, a wonderful uh, short lesson about the human rights and the ICJ, how they are acting on human rights. And uh, I think it's also important that they are dealing with highly political uh, disputes, it's always the first defense in admissibility that this highly politi political issue should not deal with it. The courts always say it's a legal fact in it, a legal dispute, we will take it on. But in the past, they have not wanted to touch to review decision of the Security Council, Lockheed Bee case and so on. It's then completely different attitude from the court. But it has been in a while since they had had that issue before them. I'm just curious if you have some either as a judge or a personal view on this, whether the court, how they should proceed in that, this area. Thank you. Thank you, Thordis. And I think you're the last speaker that has asked for the floor, isn't it? Are there any others? You have the floor, okay. sir. Um, if uh, an authoritarian system could create a better economies, then I think uh, Russia had to be the best in the world. So uh, my question is uh, uh, another uh, thing, and I'm going to ask to Christos about the Council of Europe. I think the Council of Europe is the best uh, institution in Europe which uh, can guarantee the human rights uh, in terms of its mechanisms and especially because of the court. But recently we see that its influence is reducing, especially uh, because of the European Union's uh, uh, new constitution, etc. So how do you see the future of the uh, Council of Europe? And maybe uh, Mr. Hammerbeck could also react to this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any further requests for the floor? Hammerbeck, you have the, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I leave to Christus to answer the last question. Just wanted to also give a little bit of attention to the uh, intervention by Alexander. I think it's very important in the human rights discussion also to look at the power of the secret services because many of the human rights violations and the serious ones are actually committed by people employed by the secret services. And the problem there is that there is an almost recognized and accepted policy that what is being done by the secret services shall not be discussed. Journalists are prevented from, from getting the facts and, and it's very difficult to bring cases to the courts in most countries. Uh, the war on terror, starting after the 9-11, the was a total disaster for, for human rights. And it, it, it revealed that in some cases, in some countries also in Europe, the secret, secret, uh, secret services were actually more um, 
commanded by and guided by CIA in Washington than by their own governments. And we have still not overcome the, the effects of the activities by the secret services in cooperation with one another in Europe. We still have prisoners 12 years later in Guantanamo. We still have not had any case in, in Europe which has clarified the role of the secret services when it comes to cooperation with that. In Poland, there's still an investigation going on on whether there was a secret place, we know it was, in, in Poland where torture was, was committed. There's, there's a case coming up now in the European Court on, on Human Rights when it comes to Romania. We know we have the facts, but it has to be recognized by some authorities because the governments in those two cases, they still go on to deny. And the denial is not an acceptable um, remedy when it comes to, to what has really been committed. So there we have a big challenge and try to cut through the, the curtain of, of, of silence when it comes to human rights violations by Secret Service. So I'm very glad that you raised that, Alexander. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, as we are running very late, uh, I will now uh, invite uh, the panel to make uh, very brief remarks, respond to questions and comments. Uh, and then I will simply encourage you to continue the discussion this evening and tomorrow, uh, because we also, we have, uh, we are gonna have a round up uh, of, of uh, Omidr is gonna wrap up the discussion today, isn't it? Yeah. So yes. af af after, I, af after we conclude this panel, so. Uh, I will start uh, in the same order as we started the panel today. So I, I, I invite you to, to make uh, very brief remarks. Thank you, Madam Chairman. As regards the role of the, the declining role of the Council of Europe compared to the European Union, I don't agree with that, as li at least not as regards human rights. Um, it is obvious that the EU has a financial capacity and has also an operational capacity that the Council of Europe does not have. They also have a legislative responsibility, which again the Council of Europe does not have. The Council of Europe is a classical international organization, UN type, where member states abide by the rules of the Council of Europe because they ratify the conventions. In the EU, there is a legislative body that takes decisions, and sometimes it's not even the legislative body that takes the decision, but a uh, <coughs> gathering of, of uh, technocrats. This being said, uh, I don't think that there is, uh, the, the, the two legal orders are, are uh, replaceable. It is obvious that the European Union is responsible for its own action. The Council of Europe is responsible for the action of its member states, including the EU member states. So there is no problem there. Where there will be a problem is um, um, the, when the EU will or will not ratify the European Convention of Human Rights so that the EU law will be under the, um, uh, the, the, the um, European Court of Human Rights. And the fact that it is not yet is again because of the conviction that many member states have that the international control is not necessary. The EU believes that it protects human rights better than the Council of Europe. You can see how it does it through the EU-Turkish agreement. Let me now turn to the question that was put by Dimitris. Indeed, I believe that uh, 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 the democracy is necessary for the economic growth and not vice versa. And I would say, first of all, I would like to say about for Mr. Otorbayev, that I think that indeed there is a need to rethink some aspects of democracy, but not in the way it has been put. I think that we need to reconsider aspects in democracy so that democracy does not become a dictatorship of a majority. That is the key issue, and that is where constitutionality <coughs> plays a role, uh, and also international uh, agreements, but not in the sense of uh, the benevolent dictatorship. Um, economic growth is, of course, sometimes necessary to guarantee rights, but this does not mean that whenever you have economic growth, you have rights guaranteed. It's, uh, it, there is no link between the two. You may have an important economic growth with no rights at all. And of course, sometimes when you have rights, these take the form of a corruption or of, or of massive corruption, providing everyone with a fridge or a television uh, and in, in, um, 
uh, in the place of uh, freedom of expression or uh, free access to, to, to a fair justice is a kind of, of massive corruption, and it actually does not help uh, neither the middle class nor any citizen to get out of this, uh, um, um, uh, of this uh, situation unless with a violent uh, rebellion, which we have seen on several occasions, and this is uh, how things are. Um, people need rights and access to justice. They don't need charity. And this is the situation that we face today increasingly. We are in a situation where what the governments, what the wealthy people, what business provides is charity instead of rights. And that is which the basic crisis where, through which we, we are going. And that is why we need to stick to the existing con con conventions. Alexander said, made a brilliant presentation of the case law of the European Court of Human Rights based on a single article that protects private life and which is able to deal through this with a number of issues like secret security files, secret surveillance, which are today's challenges. If we go into his last proposal, with which I disagree, to make now a new convention on secret surveillance, do you really believe that we will reach the same results as the ones that we reached through the case law of the European Court of Human Rights? I am afraid that we will have plenty of member states who will be ready to water down this convention and reach uh, another one that will probably have uh, no rights whatsoever. And it, this convention, the new one, will apply in the face of the European Convention of Human Rights, in the face of the Covenant of the United Nations, as lex posterior deroga priori, and also as lex specialis <laughs> against the lex generalis. So I really believe that we have to stick to the uh, conventions that we have and not engage in such a challenging environment as the one we live to in new uh, uh, operations. I also think uh, that we need to stick to the national implementation of human rights because the example that was given by Julia is nonetheless quite important. Both the, Euro the International Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights will give wonderful judgments about people who suffer and they will continue to suffer because the international courts do not have an immediate impact on what is happening. A judgment of the United States about the people who have been convicted to death would have as a result that their lives would have been saved. The judgment of the International, Criminal, of the international Court of Justice or any judgment of the European Court of Human Rights will not have this effect unless it is fully implemented. And this is a real challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I turn to Julia. Very briefly, um, I do agree with, with, with you, uh, Tuli, that the ICJ has only itself to blame for failure to outreach more, uh, to, to make itself better known by states. And, and I think that's a challenge we have to live with. Uh, on the question of how do we navigate political issues in, in the ICJ, um, if a case comes that is fraught with political uh, issues, well, we have a policy, and I think uh, in, in many cases you, you will see this when you read the judgments, that the fact that a case has a, a great political content is not a reason for the court not to admit that issue and to, to, to deal with it. What we do is we sift the legal issues that have been referred to us, and I must say with, with great skill we do this, uh, to identify the legal issues and deal only with the legal issues and leave the political issues aside. So, and it's possible to do that. Uh, very quickly on uh, the role of the Secret Service um, and intelligence uh, organizations, um, I think it, it was a very fitting subject that was introduced. Today we have the, the problem, uh, the global problem of terrorism and many countries are phone tapping uh, our private conversations in the name of controlling terrorism. But also many governments are abusing that um, ability. So the, the question remains is how far should states be allowed to intrude in the private conversations and dealings um, or discourse of individuals? Uh, there, there's got to be a balance um, in, in, in every respect. Of benevolent dictators, I'm, uh, I am afraid I, my experience disagrees with my neighbor. 
uh, from where we come from, the saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely is very real in Africa. In fact, I would say that the, 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 the notion of a benevolent dictator is a myth in Africa. Um, even if for a month they started out that way, at the end of the day, they will be corrupted absolutely because of the sheer power that they have. And always we descend into the quagmire of bad governance in any event. They weaken the institutions that they found there that were strong. And, and the more that happens, the more, it's like a vicious cycle. Um, and of course, uh, like I said, uh, or like, like, like um, I think one of the speakers said that uh, I think uh, even a weak dictatorship, is a, a weak uh, democracy is certainly better than the, the best kind of dictatorship you can think of. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, now I turn to uh, Alexander. Thank you. Two very brief remarks. Uh, uh, one is... Uh, a uh, short reaction, not a reply, uh, to Christo's last comments and one uh, and as the comment and uh, the reply to uh, Thomas' comments. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, please, Christos. Uh, my goodness, I, I never would propose to, to start any negotiations or discussion on a new conventions. No, no, please, no. The best conventions were those uh, entered, concluded in the, in the third uh, quarter of the past century. Quite simple, currently having, uh, uh, having uh, very often uh, more than 100 signatories functioning and so on. No, my proposal was to start a discussion how to improve the efficiency of controlling mechanisms in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the time when you are under the control, under the surveillance. Uh, every time when you show in the shop your, your, your uh, credit card, every time when crossing the, uh, crossing the street uh, uh, under the uh, public TV uh, camera surveillance uh, every time if you dial number on your on your mobile uh, and the the, the time uh, the, the movement uh, in the technical uh, the technical development uh, uh, opened completely new doors and from my point of view it can be called simply a Pandora's box uh, being opened due to the digital uh, as, as opening the digital age which opened completely new possibilities for surveillance by public uh, secret services and I completely uh, completely agree uh, agree, Thomas, that secret services uh, uh, are uh, currently usually out of the control of their own government. And this is, uh, uh, my proposal was just start a uh, discussion how to improve the efficiency because in the situation when you are under the control uh, every minute, uh, on, on uh, every step you are doing, such mechanisms like, for example, European Court of Human Rights, when you can file a, uh, uh, file a claim and you will wait six, seven, eight uh, or more years for a decision, uh, which actually looks very nice, you will be satisfied, but it does not bring, in fact, nothing mm. in, in a daily life. That's why we have to think about mechanisms. How to do it, how to make domestic. it. In particular, domestic. Domest, dom, both domestic. <laughs> However, I do think that domestic mechanisms will not uh, work without some international, supervisor. international supervisor. This was my proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, now I turn to uh, uh, former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, Dumar Tosabayev. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, try to be very brief. First of all, I am a pro-democracy person. Don't, don't attack me as a pro-totalitarian, authoritarian guy. Uh, I wanted, in the beginning, I made it very clear, I wanted to provoke discussions. 
The world is not black and white. There are cases and cases. And I'm very happy to hear that almost all your comments completely coincided with my ideas. Otherwise, I would not go from London to Bishkek, because I knew these cases, how difficult <coughs> to run economy under the early fragile stages of democracy. So we have to think. Uh, what is important that we will go from this meeting not with the answers only, but with the questions. This is one of the strong parts of the round tables, and that is was my intention to provoke a little bit healthy discussion. <laughs> I specifically made one dimensional statement, focusing only on the economic dimension without mentioning <laughs> other th qualities. But I will continue to live in my country. And I said it specifically that with clean air of democracy and freedoms, you can't go back. So this is quality of life. It's not only full stomach or full uh, house of some things. It's something else. This is, I completely agree. Second, I am not lectured you. I am making a few statements which I believe could bring you for some thoughts that it's not black, white. It's something more, more uh, difficult issues. Uh, so, uh, but I want to be maximalist. I want to live in a country which is democratic and developing quickly as well. And unfortunately, sometimes these two things are not coinciding with each other. But this is reality, and the more we will be talking about these issues, I think the better we will be preparing. Uh, so I specifically made it provocative way, but believe me, I am not arguing for authoritarian strong men. I know how sensitive it's in a part of a couple of countries around the world this matter. I always will be pro-democracy, even though it will not be bringing skyrocketing economic growth. And uh, finally, one specific question. Uh, my. Um, uh, on, on Syria, Tunisia, which uh, you just mentioned. Uh, I'm no specialist on Arabic uh, countries, but um, Syria is the most complicated country from the point of view of ethnic and historic differences. And Tunisia, probably one of the easiest in that respect. The homogeneous society, as well as existence of civil society, strong civil society in that country, and strong middle class, with all other components brought this country a little bit more to a more or less sustainable way of survival. It's very difficult. Uh, it should be another couple of hours we could discuss peculiarity of this uh, development in each of these countries. It's very complicated. But uh, this is a role of political economists to consider all of these things. So my statement is that democracy is the best system, but very complicated to practice, to move to the strong economic growth in the fragile early stages of that democracy. So I want, I will be happy that if, if many of you will go from this round table with more questions, that next time we will get interesting continuation. We will be thinking, we will be debating, disagreeing. Agreement will not create healthy debates. Disagreements create healthy discussion and will bring outputs. So if we all agree, why, why are we, we sitting here? So I specifically dropped to your, this provocative theme, and I'm very happy to hear such reaction. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, sir. You certainly succeeded in provoking a discussion <laughs> in the room. Uh, uh, before I conclude the panel uh, and hand the floor over to Aumunder, uh, I have a small reminder from the Prime Minister's office. It will only take 30 minutes to read it out. Sorry. No. Uh, in your folders, uh, there is an invitation from the Prime Minister of Iceland to participants in this roundtable. Uh, to attend a reception at the government guest house at Tjartagata tomorrow. Uh, there is a small typo in the invite that I realized. Uh, the reception takes place at the government guest house tomorrow, not on the 28th, 
29th, this is a, the reception is uh, Friday 29th, starts at 18.45 at the government guest house. And uh, we hope to see all of you there. Uh, with those words, I thank all of, you, all of you for the participation in this panel. Congratulate Aumundur and his excellent team for the great organization of this event and hand the floor over to Aumundur.